Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Black History Month 22. Uh, first of all, I would like also to congratulate again uh, Deb Bell, one of our best students, actually, uh, who is a uh, major in agribusiness and a minor in international affairs. She is the winner of the travel voucher, uh, and we are really happy for her because she deserves it and much more than that. Uh, we also would like to thank everybody who's partnered with us throughout Black History Month. Uh, and uh, in particular, the uh, global office, because actually it really takes a team of people and a team of partners to build what we, what has been happening over these past few days. So I definitely look forward to this. And uh, Dr. Lansford, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Chom. So happy to be here, everyone. Um, so honored to be in the presence of uh, so many um, of our leaders here at Tuskegee University. So. I won't be long winded. We've got a, a great panel of people speaking today. And then I know you all have some questions you want to get in. So how we're going to do today's panel, I'm going to introduce the deans that we have here today and give them each um, three minutes to just kind of give an introduction and a background and overview of their college. Um, and then I will ask them an opening question, um, give them some time to reflect and which Point after that, those of you here in attendance are welcome to ask questions through the chat box in the Zoom feature. Um, if you have some questions that you would like that, to ask the Dean. So um, even though I come from the College of Agriculture, I can't play any favorites. I'm gonna have to go in alphabetical order and I'm gonna, or the colleges I've come from. So I'm gonna start off here today. Um, give me one second by welcoming Dr. Aglin from the College of Engineering. Dr. Aglin, if you can give us an introduction and welcome to yourself and your college, and then we'll go to Dr. Bell. So Dr. Bell will be up after Dr. Aglin. And um, keeping in time, how I'm gonna help you guys keep time, I'm gonna cut my camera off. And then when you get to your last 30 seconds, I'm gonna cut my camera back on and smile at you. And then we'll go over to Dr. Bell. So I'm gonna cut my camera off and give you your three minutes. Welcome Dr. Aglin. Okay. Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm very uh, pleased to um, join that uh, panel. Uh, the College of Engineering um, has been here for a while, and uh, we have five engineering programs undergraduate. We have uh, aerospace, chemical, electrical, computer, mechanical, and also uh, we have a graduate program in uh, material science and engineering where we offer master and PhD in material science and engineering. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we have some challenges with the COVID pandemics. Uh, before COVID, we never thought that we we're going to offer our hands-on classes uh, virtually or hybrid, uh, but uh, due to um, the uh, innovation of our faculty, we have managed uh, successfully to offer these uh, hands-on classes uh, virtually. And there are a lot of, uh, through simulation or faculty going to the lab. And fortunately, in the last two years, the College of Engineering has expanded its um, research. Uh, we've, uh, our faculty have uh, got uh, five patents in uh, less than uh, two years. Uh, we have uh, increased our uh, funding research substantially uh, through uh, some uh, research center of excellence, uh, a lot of funding by faculty. And uh, the important thing also is uh, engagement with industry. Our industry uh, have been very supportive and uh, uh, especially during the pandemics. And I just give you an example. We have managed with one company to uh, get uh, in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 1.5 million uh, just to upgrade our um, IT, our uh, smart uh, classrooms, and also uh, the engineering labs uh, in preparation for our accreditation. A bit. So these are the support from industry uh, in, and also the federal government. Uh, so that's all what I have about uh, College of Engineering and I would like to be happy to answer any questions um, later on. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Aglin. You did that in um, showman's timing as well. So thank you for yielding that extra minute over to Dr. Bell. So we'll go over to Dr. Bell, the Dean of the School of Architecture and Construction Sciences. Dr. Bell, will you please um, introduce yourself and in, um, address the audience here today? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carla Jackson Bell. Of course, I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and Construction Science. Been the Dean for the past six years now. I do wanna tell a little bit about our history of our program because we have a distinct history in TSACS. Uh, we are the oldest uh, construction trades program in the country. Booker T. Washington started our program with building trades, the painting, brick making and plastering in 1893. And so we were the only school that, that had the architects here, the African-American architects from all over the country to teach the students the brick making process and to design the buildings. And we were the only school that actually had uh, students constructing and building the buildings from the, from the natural clay in the community. Also, you know, Robert Taylor is the, was the namesake for our school. He's the first MIT graduate and the first African-American licensed architect in the country and he came down and he started this program with many other architects like Wallace Rayfield, Burton or Tandy, all of them were African-American. And so we're very proud of that distinction. It's also um, highlighted in our, our latest uh, ACCE uh, Association of Colleges of Construction and Engineering Schools. So we're documented to be the oldest trades program. Also, just a little bit about our program. We have seven full-time faculty members, uh, seven adjuncts. That's a little high for, for us right now. We're, we're working on some things, um, some new programs in our, in our school, and then one visiting professor. We have about 125 uh, students. We're growing. We have two buildings, Wilcox A, Wilcox C, and we are expanding Wilcox E. Once we expand Wilcox E, we'll be able to grow a little bit more. That will be our construction department in that building. We have a, a B arch in architecture, 169 credits, five-year professional program. It's accredited by NAB. Uh, under that, we have uh, two new minors, African-American history and architecture, which is uh, partnered with this Department of History. Lisa Braddon is the co-PI co, um, for that program. And um, that's 18 credit hours. And then Historic Preservation is 18 credit hours as well. That's uh, Dr. Uh, Crazy Daniels is leads that minor. In Construction, Construction, we have 128 credit hours for that program as four four-year program. It's also has been uh, first time accredited back in uh, 2017 since its inception in 1893. So we are very proud about that uh, construction accreditation. Under that, the minor we have is residential construction is 18 credit hours. Um, and that will start in fall 2022. We also have, um, we're gonna be starting a Bachelor of Arts in Design program, a four year design program, which, which has been approved by the provost, the new provost, 133 uh, credit hours. It's gonna be starting um, in fall 2022 as well. And it's gonna feature the emphasis on visual arts, industrial design and interior design. And so we're very proud about that program and um, we're proud about the process that we're going through. We're really growing um, exponentially in our program with our grants. We just received a grant for um, $1.5 million from the Mellon, Andrew Mellon Foundation. It's a partnership with the, with the Graduates Program of Historic Preservation at UPenn. And we will be using that money to develop a new master's in historic preservation. That program will be the first graduate program of any HBCU in the country. And it's the first, of course, in the Southeast. Um, we're very proud about that. And it will document, we will buy materials to document the uh, buildings on campus because we're historic. We're Okay, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Uh, L Lunsford, I just I just saw you. <laughs> okay, so my time is up. Thank you. I'll talk about that a little bit more of that about that a little bit later. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson Bell, for bringing in so much of that history. I try to put it in the chat box. Thank you for starting us right off with some Black history that is right here on our Tuskegee University campus, as well as leading into some of the history that you all have been making um, in, in your college. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I will lead it over. I said I wouldn't play favorites, but big smile to my home dean, Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. I will um, pass it over to Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. And after Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller, we'll go over to Dr. Jelani. Um, so Dr. Jelani, just letting you know, you'll go after Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. Same thing, I'm gonna cut my camera off and send it over to you, Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. Thank you so much, Lindsay. So good afternoon and happy Black History Month. It's very fitting that we get a chance to kind of wrap up this month with this particular panel. Um, I am newly in just over, just not quite, um, just shy of two months, um, being the Dean, of course, for the College of Agriculture, Environment and Nutrition Sciences. I'm very excited to be here with you all today to share a little bit about our college and really to um, help us, you know, take a look at the history that we do have here. We always think about Tuskegee University as a historical place, but we don't always revel in that history. So our college is a little bit different from the other colleges in that in addition to our two academic units, which boasts four academic programs, we also have our cooperative extension program, as well as our agriculture extension and re ex sorry, our agriculture um, experimental station. And so we really embody the land grant system and the land grant institution with teaching, research, and extension. In our academic programming and our academic unit of food and nutritional sciences, we do have our major of food and nutritional sciences. And one distinction for that department is that it does hold one of the only um, accredited dietetics programs in the country at a historically Black college or university. In our Department of Ag and Environmental Sciences, we do boast the number one program in animal and veterinary sciences, only rivaling with North Carolina a and as to who has the most undergraduates in that program. And we kind of vacillate back and forth from year to year. But that notwithstanding, 50% of all African-Americans within veterinary schools across the country, of which there are only 30, actually come from our undergraduate program. And so not only are we a feeder program for our vet school, which of course is the only one at a HBCU, we're also a feeder program for all of the vet schools across the country. Um, in addition to that, we have our major in agribusiness, as well as our, un our umbrella program in environmental, natural resources, and plant sciences, which is also one of the leading natural resource programs in the country for African Americans. In terms of history, of course, we are the home of George Washington Carver, who started this agricultural program coming in from Iowa State. Not only was he instrumental in revolutionizing agriculture here in the South, his work actually revolutionized agriculture across the world. And when we think today about history makers and we think about historical figures like Carver, we also have current history makers, such as Walter Hill, who is the most past dean here at the institution. We're very excited to um, carry on the spirit of all of those who've come before us in terms of excellence here in agriculture, continuously bringing in dollars to support, to support student education and experiential learning, including a recent $2 million grant with the Kellogg Foundation to support not only experiential learning for our students, but to have an impact in community and how we look at food and health and the impact of those out in the community. So we look forward to continuing to expand our partnerships, including that with um, a recent partner here to the University, Cargill, who has solicited, solicited our college to um, submit for additional dollars to expand our red meat processing facility um, for which the president of the United States just also put forth um, and pledged $1 billion for. So we look forward to exciting things in the future to come as we continue to make history here at Tuskegee University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bolden Tiller. Um, and again, thank you for, it seems like we've got a continuing theme of acknowledging history, Black history that Tuskegee has made in the past, as well as some modern day living, breathing history makers. So thank you for highlighting that. And um, we're actually going to move um, right into um, 
Dr. Huang and the College of Business and Information Sciences. And we'll uh, circle back to some other folks later. So I apologize for not giving you a previous notice, but I know you stay ready, sir. So I'll pass it right over to you and the College of Business and Information Sciences. And just to let you all know, um, after him, we'll go over to Dr. Carlton Morris and the um, College of Education. So thank you so much. I'll cut my camera off and, and come back on towards the end of your announcement. Thank you. And you're muted if you don't mind unmuting so we don't miss anything. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers for today for the opportunity to share with you information about the College of Business and Information Science. Um, the College of Information Science is named after Andrew F. Brimmer. Most befitting because of successful as well as uh, the son of a sharecropper who actually became uh, the first African-American governor of the Federal Reserve. So we're very honored to be in this building that is named after him. Uh, the college has six different areas of uh, programs. First and foremost of accounting, uh, finance and economics, management, sales and marketing, supply chain management, computer science and information systems. Those are our undergraduate programs. And then for the graduate program, we have a master of science in um, computer information systems where the concentration is in the area of cybersecurity and in data science. Uh, each of our departments have about eight faculty members. So there are 24 faculty total. And uh, most important in the case of the master's degree, uh, it is also built together with two centers, uh, one being the Center of Excellence, uh, which is denoted by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, under this program is the scholarship for service. Students in this program have a 60 some thousand dollars scholarship. So if you're thinking about this program, this will be an excellent program for you to join. Uh, this program offers that as a stipend as well as uh, uh, school support. And uh, it also pays for your insurance as well as others. Um, <clears throat> the other center is an Apple center. Uh, we are a uh, center that is in is done in collaboration with uh, Tennessee State University. And because of that, uh, we are part of cohort two. Actually, we are we were actually uh, privileged. We were featured uh, as the one of five centers during the welcoming ceremony for cohort three. Our curriculum is guided by ASCSB, which is our business accreditation, and ABAT, which is our computer science accreditation, uh, as well as a total of 27 executives that serve on our, on our advisory board, uh, who are from Fortune 500, as well as from uh, venture capital companies. Uh, apart from that, um, we have this year, we're happy to report that we have over $4 million in grant generation and about a little over more than half a million dollars in scholarship donations and also in gift donations from other uh, corporate partners. Uh, our, our faculty conduct research, especially obviously in cybersecurity, in computer science, uh, but the business faculty conduct research in finance, in accounting, as well as in computing, computing information systems. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to getting questions from you. Thank you so much. And thank you for yielding that time for your fellow uh, participants. Sorry, I was getting my camera back on. We will now go over to you, Dr. Morris, um, Dean of the School of Education. Uh, please share with us. And then after Dr. Morris, we will go over to Dr. Prakash before ending with Dr. Shannon. So uh, thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Lum. Good afternoon. I am Carlton Morris. I'm the Dean of the School of Education here at Tuskegee University, and I want to welcome you to this Black History event. Um, Tuskegee University School of Education uh, has played a prominent role in the past. Um, if we would look back in our history, we'll find that the founders of this university were very wise in ensuring that 
they would provide an opportunity for newly freed slaves to get an education and prepare themselves uh, to be able to be productive citizens in this country. Uh, since 1927, uh, Tuskegee University uh, has provided bachelor's degrees in education, and it continues uh, throughout up until this time. Currently, our programs are at the undergraduate level. Uh, we have a bachelor's of arts degree in elementary education. Uh, this is one of the most popular de degrees that uh, we offer here at Tuskegee University. Uh, we also have uh, degrees at the secondary level. Uh, mathematics education is one of the STEM areas that we offer, as well as general science education. And English language arts is uh, a very uh, popular area as well. Uh, and the last degree offering is physical education. Uh, physical education is a K through 12 program. Uh, our graduates uh, can work in any grade level uh, in the public schools or private schools uh, with their physical education degree. Uh, in terms of the challenges, uh, this has been, the past few years, has been tremendously challenging uh, for uh, schools of education, including uh, here at uh, Tuskegee University. But I must say that the faculty, staff, and the students uh, have been very courageous and they have persevered to work through the many challenges uh, that we have had. Uh, specifically, our students uh, cannot stay on campus and only do book work. Uh, they must be uh, permitted to work out in the public schools. Uh, during this period, we have had to make some changes uh, in order to be able to meet those requirements and stay within the policies of the university. But we continue to persevere and we anticipate that there are going to be uh, many opportunities moving forward and Tuskegee School of Education will be getting prepared to move forward with this new generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, that bit of history with us as well and that vision for the future, Dr. Morris. I'm now going to pass it over to Dr. Prakash, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Please share with us a word, Dr. Prakash, before we end with Dr. Shannon. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Lunsford. I'm really delighted to, to share with some highlights of College of Arts and Science and some of the pride points of this college, which is many of you would know is the largest college here with uh, more than 100 faculty members and uh, a very large number of students, including uh, undecided majors that we help uh, ad advise. And we have uh, 18 programs totally, including 14 undergraduates and four graduate programs with two of the PhD programs that we, that we work with uh, two other schools in, uh, in administering. And uh, College of Arts and Science is really embedded in history. We have uh, outstanding faculty who have, uh, who have taught here, uh, including uh, Dr. Toland, who with, um, in, in his honor, the, Afri the Black History Month is celebrated. Charles Gomillion, our sociology professor, Henry Monroe Work, Dr. Jimmy Henderson, whom the Ag building is named, and, uh, and many, many uh, outstanding faculty who have taught at arts and science and continuing the tradition, we still have, uh, may, we, we continue to 
have uh, globally recognized outstanding faculty. The, the two pride points of College of Arts and Science is our student excellence and our faculty excellence. And moving forward in terms of academic excellence, we, we are trying to align ourselves in terms of the strategic planning of, uh, the pres of President Morris. So along those lines, uh, along academic excellence, uh, College of Arts and Science takes pride in being the leader in the online classes. We offer uh, something like 37 of the 40 online classes offered during summer. And moving forward, we, we are on schedule to offer two new programs, two new degrees, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies, Bachelor of Science in Liberal Studies, and uh, in online and also face-to-face -face from this fall. We're also planning uh, to offer a master's in social work uh, sometime in the near future. And already we have recently begun offering a master's in psychology. We also want to bring uh, creden uh, micro-credential classes, uh, courses in really many cutting edge areas such as data science and artificial intelligence. We also take pride in uh, start, having started a new virtual reality lab to bring immersive learning experience for many of our classes. And also uh, we are on, uh, we have, our goal is to make every classroom in uh, College of Arts and Science a smart classroom. And uh, to foster student success, we have uh, recently initiated recitation of many of uh, our core classes. As you know, CAS not only serves our majors, but the, all of the, 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 the campus in, in the core courses that we offer. And we also take pride in that our students, in, especially in biology, chemistry, and psychology, go on to medical and professional health school. We offered a comprehensive range of programs to improve our students getting into these programs, uh, such as boot camps, uh, memorandum of understanding with other medical schools, offering scholarships through Orlando Clock Endowment Fund, even providing MCAT prep material and MCAT prep tuition uh, prep, uh, fee to our students. And, uh, and also uh, we are in the last three or four years have started uh, a law school fairs with more than 90 law schools from around the, the country showing up for these school fairs. And so we, we take pride in, in helping our students move forward academically and professionally. And again, for that, we have world-class faculty and many, many stars, uh, Dr. Clayton Yates, uh, who heads our, uh, the biomedical center here, a globally renowned cancer biologist who has more than $18 million in grants, grant funds. And Dr. Kazi, uh, with a lot of grants from National Science Foundation, was recently named by President Biden uh, as a, 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 for the faculty achievement for mentoring. And so we have considerable reward and recognition uh, programs to help our faculty move forward. And we have also started a CAS Alumni Association recently. And we are hoping that we would engage with alumni more that way. And we have industry partnerships recently, as you saw, uh, Thermo Fisher, uh, and along with Gates Foundation, helped start the COVID vaccine uh, testing program with involvement from a lot of our uh, CAS faculty. And moving forward, some of our challenges are going to be to see how we can improve the faculty compensation, lower the faculty teaching load, and improve the student recruitment, retention, and uh, have indoor professors, professorships in the college, and also to see how we can increasingly engage alumni and industry. And so um, I look forward to, 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 to sharing uh, more, more of our CAS pride points as we go along during the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Lansford. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Um, it just warms my heart and I know so many of the participants listening, all of the wonderful accomplishments coming out of the colleges and the school here, it's three minutes is not enough to contain it. So we will get into our first question where we'll get to hear some more jewels from each of you. But last but not least, thank you so much for your patience. Dr. Tracy Shannon, Dean of the School of Nursing and Allied Health, please share with us before we get into the panel discussion. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. It brings me great, great pleasure to be able to tell you some of the very exciting things that are going on in the School of Nursing and Allied Health. Um, there are three programs in the School of Nursing and Allied Health. Um, the first, I'll talk about the nursing program that was um, begun in 1948. We are um, the first um, baccalaureate nursing program in the state of Alabama. So that helps us to understand that the first nurse who was licensed as a baccalaureate nurse was an African-American. So we hold that distinction. We are also um, now also holding the distinction of being one of the oldest um, nursing programs from the historically black institutions. Um, we usually have within the School of Nursing anywhere from 90 to 110 students at a time. It is a five semester program and our students are prepared as nurse generalists. And that's a good thing because that means that um, on our faculty, we have a wide range of nurses who specialize in various areas of nursing. So our students get to matriculate through um, several of the different specialty areas um, because our faculty are able to um, teach that information and take them to the clinical settings in those areas as well. Our students receive um, their clinical slash field work at the hospitals in the area of Montgomery and surrounding areas as well as in Columbus, Georgia. The last experience that they have is called a preceptorship and they are at that time allowed to choose um, where they want to go. Um, again, uh, they are prepared as nurse gener generalists, but um, they do go to um, hospitals in Birmingham for preceptorships and um, hospitals in the state of Georgia for their preceptorships as well. Um, we're proud to say that our graduates, when they leave um, Tuskegee, they, they all, 98% of them already have jobs when they leave and they are entering into um, practice with at least a $65,000 to $75,000 um, annual salary at that time. And because they are prepared as nurse generalists, our students are able to then choose the area that they want to focus in with regard to their profession. So we have nurses that leave here that work in surgery, some work in labor and delivery, pediatrics, um, home health nursing, um, and um, just a, a variety of different, um, different areas, they are, able, they are able to do that. Also in the um, School of Nursing and Allied Health is occupational therapy and occupational, the occupational therapy program was started in 1978 and graduated the first um, occupational therapist with a master of science degree in occupational therapy in 1980. And the occupational therapy program at Tuskegee holds the distinction of graduating the most African-American occupational therapists in the country the most African-American um, occupational therapist in the country. And um, we are very, very proud of, of that distinction. We usually have anywhere from 40 to 60 students in the um, occupational therapy program. Again, they are able to um, get, they are prepared as nurse generalists and um, they call their practicum field work. So they are also able to um, choose the facilities in which they want to um, do, their, do their field work. And some stay locally and some um, go other places. Some people go home. And again, usually when they graduate, they are already employed. And again, that's a a job with entry into practice anywhere from 60 to 70 or $75,000 um, annually. We also have um, the um, health science program and it's a fairly, it's a fairly new um, major, 
but um, you can get, the student can get a Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science. And most of the students who acquire that degree, they want to be in Health Science, but they're not really sure um, what, um, what professional line they want to um, spend um, the rest of their time in. So they will choose the Health Science and then that's like a ladder. It gives them an open door to a variety of majors. Um, a lot of the students are health science majors and they get a minor in social work. And um, some will um, leave after they have finished the, the Bachelor of Science degree in health science. And then they may be a, um, they may want to be a paramedic or they may want to be and uh, work in um, athletics or a dental hygienist, or they may want to work in optometry. And some will use that degree and apply for medical school as well. So um, that, that's a, a good open door um, major for those who are not quite sure what they what, what um, area in healthcare they want to go in, but they do have that leverage. And I look forward to talking with you all um, at the end of the panel discussion. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shannon. Um, thank you all. Uh, if we were all together, I, this would be where I would like ask for a round of applause, um, but my claps don't sound as loud. Um, but if you all do the, the reactions, please go ahead, do some reactions. I'm seeing some claps, um, some virtual claps. So bear with us. Zoom has created many challenges and many changes in the way we gather, which of course we're gonna get into that question. Um, but I just wanted to recap a few facts. Like if you weren't proud to be a part of the Tuskegee family before hearing this panel, I hope you are now. Um, we heard from across the school, we heard from just now from Dr. Shannon teaching us something. I learned new facts myself. Um, Tuskegee being the first baccalaure baccalaureate nursing program in the state, um, making it the, one of the oldest HBCU programs. We heard from Dr. Jackson Bell um, that Tuskegee oh, TSACs being home to one of the the oldest trade schools in the nation. So we just hear this powerful Black history coming at us recapping the life and legacy of, of Andrew F. Bremer being born a sharecropper son and ending up the first African-American governor of the Federal Reserve. This is just powerful, powerful history. Then we hear from um, Dr. Olga, Olga Bolden Tiller talking to us. Of course, we remember, you know, College of Ag Environment Science. We remember Carver, but now we're hearing about people like Dean Walter Hill joining those historic ranks. So we just see this history outpouring and coming out. And so many new, new um, grants, programs, professors just making more history. So I thank you all for giving that. Um, and I just wanted to provide that brief recap as a setting for this question that I'm gonna ask to the entire panel. So based on today's topic and theme, which is leading colleges and schools in an era of challenge and opportunity, a Dean's perspective, we got a chance to hear a lot about some of the amazing strides and successes that have come out of each and every one of your colleges or schools, but can you please tell us about the challenges um, and not let us assume for you what those challenges have been? So what is it? So this is my central question. What have some of the challenges that you have faced past the pandemic and through the pandemic? And with these challenges, if you can crystallize it, distill it down to us to maybe like one or two of your most outstanding challenges that were specific to your college or school. And then if you could follow that up with having faced this challenge, what opportunity did that create or how were you able to meet that challenge? So that would be my question to the panel. Um, tying in today's theme, what was your biggest challenge, one or two challenges that your college, that was unique to you and your college, and how did you face those challenges, and then what were the opportunities that came forth? Is there anyone, um, and I know I'll give you guys a second to reflect on that question. I see Dr. Prakash put his, put his hand up, so we'll go to Dr. Prakash first, but while you all take just maybe 30 seconds to reflect on that question, I would invite everyone in the audience, thank you Dr. Tom for putting that in the chat box. If you have a question for one of the deans, now is your chance. 
please put that question in the chat box. We will be taking questions from the audience. So please feel free. I see we have some professors like Dr. Tillman have some students in the classroom there with you. If they have questions, please put them in the chat box. We will answer those questions. Now I'm gonna go back to um, Dr. Prakash. So Dr. Prakash, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, our challenge is, uh, I'm sure something that all the deans here would, uh, would agree that was the technology in, in a way we, we, were, we were asked to jump into this virtual uh, arena of uh, uh, teaching all classes online when uh, we didn't have much uh, history of doing that before. So that was the, the biggest challenge, but it's also an, an excellent learning experience. Now that looking back two years, uh, that all our faculty have now uh, proficiency in teaching online. Uh, primarily because you know we were just asked to jump into the well, we had to learn to swim. Uh, and some of the technology challenges we were also, we are grateful we were helped by the administration here and the COVID funds, uh, as a lot of our faculty did not have access to good technology and our students did not have access to the technology. There were challenges with the connectivity, challenges with the equipment, and many of that were addressed uh, uh, by administration, by our college, in many ways, and so much so the students, uh, from what I hear, uh, don't see that as a challenge anymore. Uh, and, and also, now that uh, we, when we are uh, trying to offer more online classes, online degree programs, we have more qualified faculty, more willing faculty to do that. Not only the faculty, but I also see the, the touch points across the campus, whether it's the registrar's office, the student financial aid, uh, enrollment, all of them have now uh, are more savvy in, in addressing, reaching out to our stakeholders in the online environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. I'm actually gonna write the, the question in the chat box as well, so it could maybe be better digested and if, if, and if anyone missed it in the audience, but I'll restate the question again and then I'll go to Dr. Aglin. Um, so the biggest challenges that you all faced and then how you met those opportunities. Dr. Aglin, and then we'll go to Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. Uh, yes, one of the uh, really challenge which we, we don't know about it now is the impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, on our students academically, their, their, their learning outcomes and what they have learned during these last two years. Uh, so uh, we don't know if the sequence courses, if they got the first portion of the first course virtually or hybrid, when they come back and then are they, have they learned the material so we can start you know, giving them the, the, the next course. So these are really, this one of the major challenge and we have to face it when, when we see the students back to campus uh, because we may have to do some adjustment. Uh, we may have to start doing maybe uh, preparation classes or, or extra curriculum uh, in different courses because at the end of the day, we want the students to leave Tuskegee uh, with uh, competency in their in their field, uh, so that that is one of the challenge, and I'm sure uh, my fellow deans uh, probably will face this uh, when when it comes. Uh, but that 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 is uh, of course there are some other challenges, but they can be overcome like IT resources, of course, resources. But the the uncertainty about the the learning outcome that if our students comprehended all the materials during these two years, that, that is really uh, of, of a main concern to me, you know. And... Thank you, Dr. Aglin. So I, I heard that uh, learning comprehension was a, a major concern of yours following these last two years. And we'll now go over to Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller and after do Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller, we'll follow up with Dr. Carla Jackson-Bell. Thank you so much. Um, I think for us, and I, I think that some of the challenges that we had that have already been talked about really permeated 
um, broadly across the university and all of the colleges. So I'll just kind of focus a little bit on the opportunities. And so in our college, we were very excited for many opportunities that arose um, as a result of COVID. And um, we, we hear about the, the technology challenges, but in fact, because of COVID, we were actually able to implement some online course delivery, hybrid course delivery, and things of that nature that we had wanted to deliver previously, but really hadn't had the institutional infrastructure and support. And so um, one of the things that COVID did allow for was the opportunity for the institution to receive COVID funds and other dollars to support some of the reimagining of education here at Tuskegee University that we had not been able to implement before. And so that was very exciting for us. Also in our college, we have the only two online programs, um, they are master's degree, degree programs in environmental sciences and environmental sciences management. And as a result of COVID, again, some of the infrastructure for students onboarding as new students being 100% virtual that were not previously very strong at the institution due to us not having very many students in that line, um, they have certainly over the past two years been very well developed to the point that we are now moving forward for fall 2020, bringing on two additional online programs. One of which is an undergraduate program in animal and veterinary sciences. And it allowed us to actually partner with Banfield Animal Hospitals such that full-time employees at Banfield Animal Hospitals will be able to take advantage of our curriculum in animal and veterinary sciences as pre-vet students. And their program will be almost 100% paid for by Banfield Animal Hospital. Um, so that was one of the opportunities that had we not um, had our infrastructural changes as a result of COVID, we would not have been able to take advantage of rapidly. And so we were very excited with regards to that. Um, not to mention a lot of the different forms, I'm sure change of grade forms and things like that, um, that were created during COVID. So we were also able to take advantage of those. So just a tremendous amount of opportunity to provide educational opportunities to students, as well as our clientele, um, such as producers and K through 12 youth. We have implemented a variety of programs, STEM education programs over the past two years of COVID, being able to reach students well beyond our normal um, touch points and our normal clientele. And so that's been very exciting for us as well. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. I see we have some questions coming in in the chat box. And just to uh, let folks know, we do still have some more time in this uh, panel. So we will get to those questions. So we're going to go right now to Dr. Carla Jackson Bell. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bell, Jackson Bell. Yes, we, we have had a few challenges in our school and some, some plus, some, some pride points. So I want to talk about the challenges first. And of course, it's technology. That's, that's one major challenge. But uh, this online modality uh, has been really, has been really, has been really um, uh, stressful for us, for our teaching, for the faculty teaching. Um, we are a hands-on learning, service learning school. So we, we build and we design hands-on. So that has been limited in our, in our uh, design studios. Um, we have five design studios um, and the students that, um, that are not here on campus, we, now we have a hybrid model. We have some students that's at home and some students that's here on campus. So that has allowed uh, us to, to have uh, some social activities but we still don't have the, the hands-on learning model that we should um, have and we, we, we are going to have. Um, we are, to, to get that done, we are renovating uh, Wilcox E um, with um, the support of our school funding with this Historic Preservation Trust Fund and with the, with the Title III. And then the, the, um, the VP for, Fiscal Affairs uh, said that we we can uh, actually receive some some COVID money to support the renovation of that 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 um, that wing. So that will give us a new construction building lab. It will give us a new uh, 3D modeling lab, and it will get us a new computer 
uh, software for con construction students. So all of those will be, be enhanced basically by, for, um, based on COVID money and Title III. And so we're very um, happy about that. Also a challenge has really been also with our summer camp. We, the last two years, we have a hands-on summer camp and now it's virtual. So that has been a huge problem. I think that um, the students need to be, that want to be in architectural construction need to be on campus. And so that's been a detriment for our, for our program. But, but hopefully by the summer, we'll see if we can do more of a hybrid model for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the last of the hand raise I see for this question. Is there another Dean that wanted to um, tackle this question? If not, I can move into some of the audience questions now. Okay, so I'm gonna move in. Right now I saw a question that popped up and I see, thank you Dr. Prakash for already providing an answer. I'm gonna read the initial question and then go to you Dr. Prakash to um, add some light to this question. So this comes from um, Gilbert. Gilbert, thank you for asking, what is each Dean doing to improve energy consumption efficiency? Also, what are they doing to promote and support the transition from fossil-based energy to renewable fuel energy that emits net zero greenhouse gases and heat? And I see that Dr. Prakash already um, provided some information on that. And Dr. Bolton Tiller has already put some information. But so for those that aren't able to tap into the chat as frequently, um, let's get some verbal responses to that. So I'll go to you, Dr. Prakash, to, um, illuminate on what you put in the chat box and then maybe Dr. Bolden Tiller or whoever would like to follow after that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent question from Gilbert, uh, who many of you may know is a, a PhD scholar in the IPPD program, whose uh, research is on, uh, I think it's research is on electric vehicles or, some, or something along those lines. Anyway, uh, the energy efficiency and, and, and going green campus wide, I, there needs to be a much greater coordinated effort. And again, an individual college can only do so much. Uh, I do uh, see, for instance, a new building like Henderson Hall has a lot of green features is, you know, incorporated into it, like collecting rainwater and, uh, and then the lights get turned on only when you walk into the room with the motion sensor. Those kinds of features uh, campus-wide, uh, if adopted, would really help. And I also see a lot of waste that goes on, you know, he, in terms of heating and cooling, places that need, it, that need, need not be heated and cooled when not in use. <clears throat> I think it takes a collective effort. And uh, CAS, you know, uh, we, we try to, we strive to be energy efficient in many ways, but I, it, it requires, a, uh, as I say, an effort coming uh, driven by the facilities and led by the, the faculty. Uh, some of our faculty like Dr. Marilyn Tournay was very much interested in, in, in trying to see how she can bring <clears throat> a green consciousness across the campus. And uh, I hope she would, she would resume that and join hands with faculty from across the campus. It, it is a laudable <laughs> effort. Thank you for that, Dr. Prakash. We'll go over to Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. I saw you put some responses in the chat box as well. I did, and thank you so much, Gilbert, for certainly um, bringing that that question forward. Just if nothing else, to bring awareness to this very important issue here in the College of Agriculture, we are certainly committed to continued sustainable energy, um, and not only through practice, but more importantly through our research efforts, trying to help identify ways that we can all. Um, be more sustainable with regards to energy practices. We have several grants funded through our college that are exact, that are um, indeed studying um, sustainable energy, carbon capture, so on and so forth. We also have some projects going on looking at solar energy out on our farm and the utilization of solar energy and solar power. Um, serving as a demonstration for small landowners so that they too can save energy. So um, certainly we're doing a lot that we can serve as a model to put out in the community. Um, but here on campus, I think there are additional things that can be done. We do have a number of student organizations who have initiated 
the collection of um, recyclable items that can be utilized to provide energy as well. And here in the college, we certainly support those efforts of those students and will continue to do so. During our Earth Week, which takes place in the spring of every year during the week of Earth Day. We also have a number of different workshops and seminars that really address this issue. And those workshops are open to um, everyone who might want to attend, students, faculty, staff, community members, et cetera. We do foster a variety of very important conversations along these lines as a part of those activities as well. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Demetrius Hooks runs that Earth Week. So if anyone is interested and maybe wanted to partner D Hooks at Tuskegee.edu would be someone to link up with. And we'll continue that question. Is there another dean um, on campus that wanted to, to speak to energy efficiency? If not, I will move to we I believe we have a question from Mr. Pillman's class. Did I hear someone on mic? Okay, we'll go. Thank you. Thank you all for your answers to that to those questions. Thank you, um, Gilbert, for posting that question. We'll go over to Mr. Tillman's class. And I'll read this, this question from Daniel Hatton. Daniel asked this question directly to Dean Morris. He says, uh, Dean Morris, I am a history major who plans to become a teacher. Um, that's awesome. Is there any plans to make history education a minor slash major, sir? Hey, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, we do not have minors and all programs that are approved uh, in education uh, they must be approved through the Alabama State Department of Education. Uh, that in itself uh, requires uh, specific guidelines, codes, and stipulations for majors. Uh, at this time, uh, you, some of you may have heard about an, it, uh, something that the state of Alabama is doing to enhance uh, getting more teachers uh, to come into the public schools. Uh, history is one of the secondary areas. Uh, usually uh, candidates who want to go into history uh, at this time, they would get a degree in history because history is one of those areas that uh, currently uh, the state does not have a high priority in terms of the shortage areas. But in order for one to get into history at this point, they can do um, a bachelor's degree in history. Currently in the state of Alabama, it's required that uh, content uh, praxis exams must be passed in the content areas. For this particular one, there is a history uh, exam that one can take. This is a national exam. If you take that exam and you meet the state of Alabama's cut score and you're able to find a history position that is open and a superintendent that would be interested in hiring you, you can start teaching through an alternative program. Uh, in the past, there has been a, a lot of things that you have to do. Uh, but right now, the legislature is currently uh, working on bills that is going to make it much easier. So you will be hearing more about that in the future uh, in terms of you being able to get into the classroom. Uh, but currently here at Tuskegee, uh, we do not have history as a major but we know that there are changes 
uh, the COVID situation uh, tremendously cut down on the number of candidates going into the classrooms. And it has really gotten the attention uh, of the nation and several states are making uh, certification changes because literally uh, students have been discouraged based on some of the requirements that have been put in place in the past. But optimistically uh, looking at the future, uh, we think that that is going to change because of the high demand uh, that we have for teachers in all areas at this time, and especially minority teachers. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Carlton Morris. And thank you for raising that question, um, Daniel. And uh, so thank you for bringing that through for us. We will go then to the chat box again. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to raise those. I'll go now to the next question we had there, which is from Jason White. Uh, Jason says, prior to, I believe this is for all deans, he says prior to and over the course of the pandemic, there was a number of, of staff lost in a physical plant. The staffing shortage has compounded existing challenges with facilities maintenance. Do the deans have this issue on their radar? If so, how are they trying to address it? So I think this question is a, just an in general around facilities management and maintenance. Um, does anyone want to, Oh, I see someone has on mic. Was that you, Dr. Aglin? I'll go ahead yes. and pass the question over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, the question of maintenance really, it's, it's a campus wide. And um, in engineering, just our approach to that is to uh, try to balance what we can do ourselves from the engineering here, like either via our technicians or uh, our uh, staff people, uh, in addition of hiring some outside uh, vendors to do uh, the maintenance work. But it is a campus-wide uh, issue, and uh, probably it has to be addressed by the CFO or, or the, the university as a wide. But it, there are some areas where we can intervene and use some outside uh, resources like funds from to do that, to do the maintenance. If we are maintaining a lab or, or uh, uh, doing the connecting a new piece of equipment to electricity and the university does not have the people to do that, uh, we can go and you know hire someone to do that. That's exactly what we do from engineering. But it, it needs a collective approach to address that issue. A good question, uh, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Jason White, for asking that question. Thank you, Dr. Aglin, for being the first person to take a, 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 a stab at it or a, a first swipe at it. Um, and I'll pass that on to any other deans on the panel that would have um, an answer or have their own take on that um, question as well. And well, we'll also, oh, go right ahead. I believe that was Dr. Morris. I, th I think it froze up for me. I apologize on my end. So how about I'll go with Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. I see her hand and then we'll go to Dr. Jackson Bell. And I'm sorry for the technology glitch. So Dr. Bolden Tiller, we'll go to you. So just to echo um, Dr. Aglin to, to some extent, um, one of the things that we have been doing here in the College of Ag, and I'm sure all of the deans is really kind of meeting with our current physical plant staff to see how we can optimize the resources that we do have in terms of human resources so that we can leverage those and get the work done that needs to get done. We know that a number of um, facilities and pieces of equipment, et cetera, have been out of operation and really impacting research. We're also working with our new provost to help address these issues as well um, in his role um, as our leader of academic programs because all of the facilities um, certainly affects our academics from undergraduate to graduate study and just the day-to-day -day work that we do. So meeting with those individuals who are at physical plant to leverage 
current operations and then working with um, our new supporters so that we can move forward accordingly and taking advantage of some of the COVID dollars as Dr. Bill um, indicated earlier um, to really try to address these issues that have been plaguing us long-term. Thank you, Dr. Ogle teller We'll go right now to Dr. Carla Jackson Bell, and then uh, we'll go. We'll proceed with the next hands up. Thank you. Yes, I've been working with the committee, the mayor of Tuskegee, and actually the president Morris. We work on this committee that are, that are um, seeking funds to develop a workforce development center here at Tuskegee University, um, and basically one of the Wilcoxes. Right now, the city of Tuskegee is looking to develop some houses, build some new houses in the community. And we don't have enough people with trades or trades background to even facilitate that. For instance, a brick make masonry, um, HV HVAC uh, person, te technician, those type of people are not are not here in the community, and so we need that. And you know, we had that a while ago when we were um, we had we had building trades, and we had we had um, trades that just just Peyton um, uh, President Peyton actually he got rid of that program, but we really really need that program because it was very expensive. So we need to get more building trades here on campus. And I think that that would help a lot because we are because we don't have that capability. And so I think that's something that we really should think about as a collective working together to get a trades, a workforce development center here on campus to, to train you know, people, young men and women in a community that may not be able to get a four year degree, train, uh, train them to get a trade that will actually accommodate these needs that we need in the community. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Jackson Bell. And we'll go over to Dr. Kuhn from the College of Business and Information Sciences, if you can please also share a note with us as well. Thank you very much. I think in general, maintenance is something that we look to the maintenance office uh, when it comes to uh, operations of the building. But in the area of computing, what we're doing right now is that we are, we are discussing the possibilities of a joint appointment with IT. This is very hard based on the budget that we get to bring in somebody who could do the type of maintenance as well as uh, lab work that we do. So I think one possibility is for us to think about joint appointments and also at the same time, make the, have, make the best use of our resources that we have. Thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Kuhn. I see that we also have a note from Dr. Chan that the provost is is will is going to be making some closing remarks. So we will definitely save time at the end of the program for that. But before we get into that, we still have a few more moments for questions. And I wanted to acknowledge the comment that Dr. Prakash put in the chat box regarding procuring a new simulation software called Labster, um, which is making some dynamic changes to the program. I think we're getting a little sound in well, if everyone can mute yourself, if you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to give Dr. Prakash a, a chance to, to speak about that and also raise a question to the deans following Dr. Prakash. If you could share any new exciting technologies that are coming to your programs or that you're um, that you're schools or colleges are utilizing now that we could look forward to on the horizon. Um, I'll ask that question again after Dr. Prakash gets a chance to speak to Labster, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, as, uh, as I put in the chat box and along with all the other colleges here, one of our biggest challenges was when we had to go completely 100% virtual because of the pandemic was, how are we going to teach these hands-on classes? You know, we really need to, we have uh, quite a lot of hands-on classes, whether it's music, it's biology and chemistry and physics, they all have lab components in it. And it is not very easy to, to teach them online and there are no, uh, no ready-made answers for that. But fortunately, but for some of them, we are able to get this labster come in and fill in. Uh, it, pro it essentially provides a simulation when you have to do some 
chemistry exercises or biology lab exercises instead of doing it into the lab you do it in a, in a simulated software which provides a very similar experience it's not as good as you doing it hands on yourself but it's probably the second best and uh, and uh, and I, I thank the university uh, you know for helping uh, provide with dr uh, dr bell when she was the interim provost to help procure the uh, that software for us which Dr. Aglan later continued. And, uh, because, and also through COVID funds, our, one of the biggest challenge was to teach, how do you teach anatomy and physiology? We have more than 120 students every year taking anatomy and physiology, both first and second classes. We have students mostly coming from nursing, but also a lot of biology and food science students take that class. And again, by, by having access to two special, software modules, Dr. Alicia Robinson is able to use that to teach one of that has a, access to 2 million images of the anatomy and physiology of the body uh, dissection uh, parts and uh, uh, has uh, some very good uh, augmented reality images of many of this. And that helped, helped us somewhat. And this is for, the laughter is for the whole campus. It's not just for us. And so, we have, made, we have made it, uh, we have announced it widely and uh, other faculty across other colleges are also using it to teach some, some labs in their, in their areas. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you for sharing that and also putting that in the chat box for us. So I also added my question in the chat box for further clarity and I'll raise this to all of the deans, which is what new and emerging technologies are you excited to utilize um, in your school or college? And I see Dr. Aglin um, will go to you first and then any other dean that would like to go next, if you'll raise your hand or we'll just pass it on over to you. But Dr. Aglin, please, you have the floor. Uh, yes, it's really, it's not a, a piece of technology. It's a major initiative uh where in engineering we are uh, working toward that and we have successfully achieved uh that what we call it uh, centers of excellence and these are major um uh, in, uh entities or initiatives uh in the college of engineering where you bring um the industry or the government and you have uh, the center of excellence in various areas, selective areas. And normally you're talking about a million a year for 10 years. At, and then in addition, you bring faculties from various disciplines to work together, students, undergraduate and graduate students, and then bring the industry also to campus. And these center of excellence we have here, we have at least, I know of at least we have uh, five of them in engineering. We recently got two. And these are um, really uh, helping us with building their capability on campus, track records, and also bringing um, uh, industry to uh, work with us on uh, applied research. And that has been our really our niche in the College of Engineering, major initiative, many faculties, and faculty working together with the industry. So that's one thing we have in, uh, in the College of Engineering. Thank you, Dr. Aglin. That's very exciting. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We'll go next to Dr. Shannon, and then I believe Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. Um, with, with regard to um, interesting, new and interesting um, methods for teaching, um, during the, the time that we were um, experiencing um, the transition with COVID, we actually acquired um, simulation equipment. And um, we are now, we now have new simulation equipment um, with a birthing mother. And um, we have um, simulation equipment um, whereby um, it's telehealth equipment. So we are able to uh, work on a pediatric patient in one of our simulation rooms. And then we could have two other classes who are in two different classrooms because we have the whiteboards with the real time um, cameras. They can actually see what's going on in the simulation lab um, with the pediatric patient. So um, we have acquired a lot of um, technology 
in Basil O'Connor that has helped us a lot. And um, I wanted to share also just piggyback on something that, that we talked about earlier. Um, when, I, when we transitioned immediately into um, the, the virtual setting, we had students that were in health assessment and they had just started vital sign assessments. So these are students who had never done blood pressures, never taken a pulse before. And uh, we had to find a way for them to um, learn to do that without being in the lab at the bedside with us. And um, really we thought we as, as nurses, and I'll just say old school nurses, um, we couldn't um, visualize that in our minds. But what we found with some of our students is um, when we asked them to use um, family members, some of the family members had underlying diseases. So on a mannequin, when you, when you check an apical pulse, like listen over the heart, it's at the second intercostal space, fifth at the fifth, at, right at the clavicular, the mid clavicular line. So when you are doing it on that mannequin, you always put it in the right spot. But if that grandmother has hypertension and the heart is a little bit enlarged, what we have to share with them in a clinical setting is that it's not going to be right at the point of maximum impulse. It's going to be shifted to the left. So uh, the short version of that is they got a chance to see the abnormals. So they had to look for the pulse and feel for the pulse. And it took them a little bit more time. So they were even a little bit more proficient when they got to the clinical setting than they would have been just with that, um, that perfect scenario in the lab. So it had its, 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 its good and its bad. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, real story with us, Dr. Shannon. That was going to be my follow-up to you was how, what was the students' reactions? But thank you for sharing that. I'm going to go right over to Dr. Uh, Olga Bolton-Tiller. Then we're going to go to Dr. Jackson Bell. And that'll wrap this question because we want to have a, enough time for you all to have closing remarks. So Dr. Prakash, I see you put something in the chat box. We will, when you do your closing remarks, I'll ask you to illuminate on that as well. So we'll go Dr. Bolton-Tiller, Dr. Jackson Bell, then we'll let you all have your closing remarks before we hear final word from Dr. Hargrove, the provost. So uh, Dr. Bolden Tiller, please. Um, so one of the things that we've been excited about is the opportunity to always give students a chance to, to do real work, um, have experiential learning as a part of the classroom. Oftentimes, a lot of that work is done as an undergraduate research experience, and we do quite a bit of it with labs. But some of the new technology that we have um, right now is related to artificial intelligence, looking at computer vision learning, um, machine learning, really kind of putting together animal sciences as well as agriculture, both in animal sciences and crop sciences, and finding a way to address a variety of issues. So for some of our courses where we had students who were not able to come back at all and they were 100% virtual, they were able to take part in an animal behavior study um, where our graduate students had actually set up cameras that were videotaping the um, videotaping some of our goats out at the unit and the animals, you know, they were having whatever behaviors they were having. And then we worked with the computer scientists to come up with an algorithm that would translate what those behaviors meant. Did it mean that the animals might be in heat? Were the animals lame? Were the animals hungry? Did they seem to have diarrhea, so on and so forth. And so that was a really cool project that gave students a chance to really look at emerging technologies that are really hitting in the field of animal and veterinary sciences to kind of help diagnose animals. Um, similarly, for our students who were here in our plant science side, um, instead of working in larger groups in plant science settings in terms of our laboratories, we have some farm bots where we have these robots that are programmed to determine um, how much liquid is in the soil to evaluate and sense nutrients and what have you in the soil. And so working with the farm bot, the students were able to, again, take data from a computer that had sensed those different variables and determine if plants needed to be um, if they needed to be watered, if they needed additional nutrients, so on and so forth. So really got a chance to do a lot of um, new cross-cutting work. Um, similarly, we do work like that with our GIS pro 
program, geospatial information system programming, which of course is essential um, to all aspects and areas that we all study. So we're excited to be able to have that technology implemented a little bit more deeply um, and have students to have those experiences a little bit earlier and have them enriched with their training. Thank you for enriching us with that response, um, for adding that. So exciting to just see this interesting technology from the School of Nursing to College of Agriculture. It's just, just very, very enriching. So we're going to now go to Dr. Carla Jackson-Bell and I'm gonna actually ask Dr. Carla Jackson-Bell to not only share her remarks, but start us off with the closing remarks. And Dr. Bell, if you'll do me a favor, when you're done with your closing remarks, if you would call on to one of your fellow deans, and if we could just follow it out like that, if you'll just call on to each other and that'll get us to the end. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I, I just want to close with, um, we have, I think the whole school, you can see that the whole university has really adapted to this new norm of, you know, this COVID environment. And I can tell you that we have, uh, as deans, work collectively together and partner together with, with different, with our different schools and, and programs. I've had, I got to have a partnership with the School of Agriculture. When I first got here, we work with uh with 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 um dr bolin tiller's school I have a partnership a recent partnership with uh this college of engineering with turner construction coming in and, and giving us some money for scholarships to build a uh not only to build tiny homes for the community but also to to do a, a capstone project and so those tiny home projects, um, you know, that's something that we were talking about with, with the Wilcox E project, that we're going to have a building construction lab. That will be something that we will do in, in collaboration with engineering, architecture, and, and construction science students to create a model for, for these small, small um, homes in a community. So we're very excited about that. Also, with um, I could just tell you a lot of things that we're doing over in, in TSACS. Uh, one, one really, really great acknowledgement I want to say before I uh, get into anything else is, is to congratulate the, the School of uh, the Department of Architecture and Construction Science for sending, um, not only sending, I think we did send, send about 15 students to the uh, Association of Home Build, Builders, uh, a chapter that we have, it's an international chapter, they won First, they won first prize, the first HBCU to win a national prize of that magnitude in the country. So we're very, very excited about this team. Um, it's led by Dr. Sh uh, Shauna Ch uh, Rogers. She's a construction science student, student and uh, faculty, and one of our architecture students won best uh, best um, best leader for that for that uh, for that actual uh, team. So we're very excited about that. Um, and also, just one more thing: we we have also have co have some collaborations with with um, with the, the school of of um, uh, Cornell University. Cornell University, we have a minor program with that with, with them, and they're going. We have students in our school that will get a certificate in re, a residential development. So those are the type of things that we're doing across campus, not only across campus but at, um, externally as well. So um, I just would lead would, would kind of well pick a person that wants to talk about something, a, a winning competition something that they want to say that we have not said uh, anybody other names. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jackson Bell. I don't know if you got a chance to see it, but you got a lot of Zoom applause oh. and a lot of like uh, celebration remarks. Oh. So congratulations again. Thank and you, Dr. I Dr. Lunch, one more thing. We're going to have, we're going to have that, we're going to announce that in a couple of weeks, the president is out of town. So she's going to take the picture and Dr. Harbour is going to take a picture with us and we will not announce that nas uh, nationally from Tuskegee University. So. Oh, so we kind of got first, we like, we got an insider. Well, into no, it's out there. It's out there, but we haven't announced it from Tuskegee University yet, but it's out there, but we, we want the, pre the 
president to announce it. So I think the deans, this is the first time I've announced it in a, in a setting at Tuskegee University. So. Well, thank you so much for that news. Uh, you got a lot of reactions. I just thank want to you. let you know. And we'll go over now to Dr. Prakash. Dr. Prakash, if you could please speak. A question, you doctor. Also there's a question. Oh, there's a question. I'm, I'm sorry, apologies. What's the question? Um, Is it in the chat box? Is still students learning virtual learning on campus or off campus? It's both, it's a hybrid model. We're still in a hybrid model. We have students in face-to-face -face and we have students um, um, on virtually as well. So it's, we're still in that hybrid modality. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Now, Dr. Prakash, if you could please uh, give us your closing remarks. And if you wanted to speak on something that you have put in the chat box, now would be a great time. Thank you. Certainly, yeah. My closing remark is to say that we are really excited in moving forward. Uh, we are excited about the strategic plan that is put together by President Morris. We just you know, had a series of meetings on that. And I think the College of Arts and Science we recognize uh, the, the, the student excellence and the faculty excellence uh, in moving forward. M many, many opportunities. I, we believe there is challenges ahead, but every challenge also provides us with an opportunity to see how we can improve the student retention, how we can improve the student recruitment, the student success, and, uh, and then uh, overall faculty excellence in retaining and recognizing the world-class faculty to, for uh, College of Arts and Science, and how we can improve some of the existing infrastructure by working with the university, which has been very helpful uh, in providing some resources, but also raising outside funds. I, I believe the, the, you know, the, 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 the grants opportunities are for HBCUs are now the, at the highest that I have seen, this is my 33rd year at Tuskegee University, and I'm really proud of that. And I've never seen the kind of grants opportunities that's out there, so especially some of those earmarked for HPCUs across all federal agencies. But it only is as, as good as the effort that we make here at the university to write proposals, to be very competitive, and even engage outside agencies to help us in some of those ways. And I think we are on the right path forward. We have fantastic leadership here. Uh, we, are, uh, we are blessed to have Dr. Hargrove as, as a provost. There is, I can see uh, there is much optimism and hope across the campus. And so I, I really see, think the bright days are ahead for us. The best is yet to come. We thank you so much for that, Dr. Prakash. I'm gonna go right over to Dr. Aglin, then we'll go to Dr. Shannon. Okay. Um, actually, the pandemic challenges have uh, brought us together, when you think about it, because we have uh, made things together as academic deans or units or the university in general. So we've developed actually more bond when we address, uh, as Dr. Bell mentioned, the uh, hybrid uh, modality or uh, virtual uh, classes. So. Um, we, we have uh, learned from the challenges and uh, this is going to help us actually moving forward. Uh, so uh, we are looking forward uh, to see all the students back to campus. Hopefully this will be in the fall. There will be some adjustment uh, we have to make, uh, but I think we will overcome that. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, more interaction uh, with the deans and with the units and with our provost, uh, Dr. Hargrove. And I think we will overcome and that challenge is uh, COVID uh, hopefully will be behind us uh, soon. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. We'll go right now to Dr. Shannon, please. Well, one of the things that I think that has um, affected, has been affected by faculty and students that's positive is that um, we all have been um, put in a mode where we have to critically think and we have to have independent clinical judgment. Even when we talked today, we talked about um, academic issues, we talked about um, fiscal plant issues. And um, although we don't work um, in 
the physical plant, sometimes we have to critically think and have independent clinical judgment to make things work. Because um, when we get, when we're in a situation and um, we don't have the manpower, we've got to figure out a way to make it work. And one thing that is make that it that it has promoted um, for us is to be forward thinkers and to be proactive. Um, we have to identify um, on Monday um, the crowd that we may expect in the building on Thursday, so that we can let them know. So that you know, if it's going to be a problem, it won't it won't be something that um, they are faced with on that day. Apologies, I was muted. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Shannon. We'll now go to Dr. Morris and then we'll go to Dr. Kung and we'll end with Dr. Bolden Tiller. So thank you so much. We'll go right to Dr. Morris. Thank you. Let me say that I'm very optimistic for education, for the School of Education. Uh, we have had significant challenges we're still working through challenges. Uh, and I would also say that uh, through these challenges, we've had opportunities. Uh, one of the areas that we have made significant strides in is uh, with the technology, being that uh, we are involved with public school partners uh, during the era of this pandemic. Uh, we've had to make adjustments. Uh, we currently have uh, new smart boards, uh, uh, faculty, uh, department heads have been trained on one that is fully functional and they are using it. We have additional uh, equipment that as soon as we can get the capacity with IT, we will put them online and we have a novelty in that one of the requirements of our, our interns, uh, the candidates who are doing the last semester of training is that they, they must uh, pass an assessment that is, it's a national test. And it's, it's not a paper pencil test. They must demonstrate teaching and they must record uh, lessons which are evaluated by a national team. And from that, it is determined uh, whether or not uh, they will be able to meet Alabama's standards. Uh, this is called the Ed TPA. Uh, we have uh, we have received some new technology which will even enhance their recording of the lessons that must be submitted. Uh, it is going to allow them to uh, put their recording device on a stand and they can put a lanyard around their neck, connect everything start their lessons, and no matter where they move in the class, the recording device will follow them. And that will keep from having the distractions of another person trying to uh, record the individual doing the test. So we're excited about that and getting uh, it implemented and in process, uh, we do see based on what is happening uh, at the state level, that we will make it somewhat easier for persons to become members of the teaching profession. Tuskegee is, is at a point where it can provide uh, a significant contribution to number one, increasing the diversity of the teaching uh, profession. Right now we have 50% of the students are of color and we only have 20%, only 20% of the teachers 
uh, are of color. So there is a vast area for improvement. And we know that uh, we have always persevered and Tuskegee is going to continue to move forward and provide leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, we'll now go to Dr. Kung. And after Dr. Kung, we'll have Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. COVID-19 has hit us pretty hard. One thing I'm very proud to say is that the students and the faculty, they have overcome. Our students are resilient and so are our faculty. And I think it's important that even though on a hot year as this, where our students are hit by death in the family, loss of employment opportunities and all that, in the last 12 months, twice we're on the top three team by competition from PNG and by, and by HP. And so I think that's tremendous when you talk about students, how they rise up to meet the challenge. We are in for better days, I'm sure, because in the last 12 months, we have much, much more assistance, readiness for help from, COVID, from the, from the uh, corporate world. And our partnership with companies, whether they be Intel, uh, whether they be, they be uh, Microsoft, reflects that they are sending not just money, most important is they're sending your people, partnering with our faculty to make our university, the university of choice, the university that we can be proud of. And so we indeed moving ahead and we will do our best. And I'm sure our uh, students will excel well in the future. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for that, sir. Thank you so much for those words. And we'll pass it over now to Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller. Thank you. I'm very excited about the, the outlook. Um, despite COVID 19, in addition to a lot of heartache, a lot of happiness also came through, a lot of opportunity. It gave us the opportunity, most importantly, to stop moving so much and to take time and to reflect with with each other and the things that are important. And not only were we able to reflect as a Tuskegee family, um, others, companies, corporate, um, governmental agencies, community leaders were also able to reflect and to remember that when the going got tough, Tuskegee got going. Um, and that resulted in Tuskegee um, providing reagents for COVID tests and, and things of that nature and, and really bringing communities together to be the Tuskegee I always call it, I like to think of it as the new Tuskegee of old, where we were at the forefront serving the community, um, educating the community on COVID-19 as we continue to do and providing education on workforce development opportunities out in the community, as well as here for our students. And so this has resulted in a plethora of additional opportunity that will transcend this finite period that we find ourselves in, including additional grant dollars for new programming, um, new collaborations, for instance, between the College of Ag and the College of um, Education to indeed not only make certain that we have additional teachers, but they're at the forefront of some of the, the areas that we want to see um, teachers in, such as computer sciences and technology. Um, also, the creation of new micro-credentials that will make people more workforce ready. So we're very excited about, um, or I'm very excited about where Tuskegee is and where, where we are and the things that we're doing and how we, again, have the opportunity to just stop being so busy, but to um, reflect on all that we have to offer and then to look at what we have to offer and share it broadly um, throughout our community, both here on campus as well as off campus. Thank you so much, Dr. Olga Bolden Tiller, for ending us with, with those strong words and that reminder to be reflective. We have now come to the end, the closing portion of, of our panel. Um, definitely, this would be where you would hear a large round of applause from our audience, from all the people that are gathered. So thank you for leading us, Dr. Hargrove. You can kind of see the virtual 
uh, rounds of applause. I'm going to hand it over to um, our provost to speak with us, Dr. F. S. Keith Hargrove, if you could leave us some closing remarks um, and lead us on out of here. I think we have a little Zoom interference. So if you if you could mute up, if you don't mind, um, anyone that probably just popped on. Um, and I also want to leave room for Dr. Chom to kind of give us some goodbye closed housekeeping remarks. So how about I hand it over to you, Dr. Chom, to give us some final words and then hand it off to Dr. Hargrove. And that will end our time here today. So thank you all so much. This has been a very impactful program. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Chom. That sounds like a plan. And this is one of those, where even though we went over time, nobody's complaining because it's all worth it. So I just want to take the opportunity to tell everybody, please log in on Friday at one o'clock for a mayor's panel. And once again, our deans have shown us why we call this place historic Tuskegee. Once again, thank you very much. Post Hargrove, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. That was spectacular. So uh, let me acknowledge Dr. Lungford for doing a great job uh, uh, mediating and facilitating this session. Uh, a big props to you. But I also want to acknowledge Dr. Chom and his whole team uh, putting together a truly spectacular uh, Black History Month lecture series. Uh, I am in awe not only for this particular session, but all the sessions that we've uh, had the opportunity to uh, listen to, learn from, uh, and be engaged over the last uh, 28 days. Uh, you know, I, as I reflect on this message about embracing our heritage, we've actually learned a lot about ourselves. We've learned a lot about others. And we learn a little bit more about our own community. And uh, you know, with the Dean sharing about some of the great work that they're doing, some of the other sessions uh, 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 within the Tuskegee University environment, but also our local community as well. So it has truly been enlightening uh, for, for, for these 28 days. Uh, but I do wanna say that, you know, Black history is 365. So if anybody wants to, uh, you know, set up a Zoom call and talk about uh, something that that's, uh, you know, similar to what we've done over the last 28 days, let's make it happen uh, and so have this kind of celebration again, 365. So uh, I just want to thank Dr. Chom and, and, and his team for, again, putting a spectacular lecture series together, all those that have presented those that have visited and listened, and a, bit, and a good shout out to the students uh, that have also been engaged, but also uh, the uh, TU uh, community and our guests from the local community. So on that note, uh, let's continue to celebrate. Uh, let's support each other uh, with one Tuskegee. And I wish you all well and all the best to each of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you all on Friday. See you on Friday. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye.